and celestial regions, may there be peace on earth. May the waters be appeasing. May herbs be wholesome and may trees and plants bring peace to all. May all beneficent beings bring peace to us. May thy wisdom spread peace all through the world. May all things be a source of peace to all and to me. Um shanti, shanti, shanti. Good morning, I'm Tom Von Kandel, president of the Rotary Club of Clemson Sunrise, and I have a call for peace that Rotary shares with Judaism. It's Isaiah chapter two, verses two through four, and chapter 11, verse six. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall, shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth instruction and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. The wolf shall live with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Good morning. I'm Altorisa Good Howard, president of the Lancaster Club. Would you please join me in Rotary's call for service above self as it is expressed in Christianity? Matthew chapter 23, verses 11 and 12. It says, the greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled and all who humble themselves will be exalted. Matthew chapter 25, verses 37 through 40 says, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that you saw me hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are the members of my family, you did it unto me. Good morning. I'm past district governor, Lorraine Angelino from the Rotary Club of Emerald City. Buddha's view of the dream of the world peace that Rotary shares. With every breath I take today, I vow to be awake. And every step I take, I vow to take with a grateful heart so that so I may see with eyes of love the hearts of all I meet to ease their burden when I can and touch them with a smile of peace. <clears throat> I'm Butch Hughes, um, the uh, Zone 1 Assistant Governor, uh, working with the Anderson and Clemson Clubs, and also member of the Rotary Club of Anderson. I am going to be reading uh, selected readings from the Quran, uh, the Holy Book of Islam, that correlates with some of Rotary's deeply held beliefs. Islam encourages education and peace by timeless sayings, such as the first thing created by God was the intellect. The ink of a scholar is more holy than the blood of a martyr. One learned mad man is harder on the devil than a thousand ignorant worshipers. 
Islam also guides universal, friendly, and peaceful relations by saying such as, no one is a true believer unless he desires for his brother that which he desires for himself. Assist any person oppressed, whether Muslim or non-Muslim. The creation is like God's family. The most beloved unto God is the one, is the person who does well to God's family. In Islam, all people are equal in front of God. Goodness is the only criteria of worth. I'm past District Governor Sue Poss, member of the E-Club of the Carolinas. This morning, we're going to remember 52 Rotarians who we have lost in the time since we were last together in 2019. I'll be calling their names, and as the name is called, someone from the club, please come up, and Faith or, or, or Pam will hand you a candle just put it in the stand and return to your seat. And we will be moving through uh, rather quickly. I wanna start with the past district governors that we have lost in the past two years. And Frank is going to light the candles for them. Past district governor, Ted Hammett, died in September 2019. He served as our governor in 1996-97 from the Rotary Club of Inman. PDG King Dixon died in July 2020. He served as our governor in 1987-88 from the Rotary Club of Lawrence. PDG Bruce Baker served as our governor in 2002-03. He died in October 2020 from the Rotary Club of Pleasantburg. These three leaders in our district will be missed. They already are. They all served diligently and as long as they possibly could, almost up until their last day. Now from the Rotary Club of Aiken, Ernie Allen, Bob Trainer, Ronnie Young. From the Rotary Club of Aiken Sunrise, Jay Jones, Bob Carnes. From the Anderson Rotary Club, Jack Glenn, Terry Kirstner, George West. From the Rotary Club of Chester, Jack Cornwell. From the Rotary Club of Clemson, Bob Nash. From the Rotary Club of Clemson Sunrise, Dick Maddox, John Medlock, Freddie Waltz. From the Rotary Club of Clinton, Bill Davis. From the E Club of the Carolinas, M.C. Yarbrough, who died Friday, and we learned of his death after we got here. From the Rotary Club of Easley, John Kuhn. Rotary Club of Fort Mill, Juliana Belsack. The Rotary Club of Fountain Inn, Sam Peden. The Rotary Club of Gaffney, John Travers. The Rotary Club of Greater Anderson, Bob Williams. The Rotary Club of Greenville, Phil Silberman, Jim Williams. 
Rotary Club of Greenville City Center, Walter Jacobs. Rotary Club of Inman, Sally Culp. The Rotary Club of Lancaster, Stompy Horton, Bill Sumner. The Lancaster Breakfast Rotary Club, Douglas Rucker. Rotary Club of Lawrence, Augusta Dixon. She died a month after King did. Rotary Club of Malden, Ralph Crawley. Rotary Club of Newberry, George Burke, Gordon Henry, James Lander, George Routon. The Rotary Club of North Augusta, Bob Meyer. The Rotary Club of North Spartanburg, Kurt Zimmerly. The Rotary Club of Pleasantburg, Herb Varn. The Rotary Club of Rock Hill, Joe Carlisle Hulick Rattery. Rotary Club of Seneca, Dan Kellerman, Dan Keller, John Ludeman. From Seneca Golden Corner, John Adams. Rotary Club of Simpsonville, Lewis Stewart. Rotary Club of Spartanburg, Harry. Morris, Billy Smith. Rotary Club of Walhalla, Joe McCall, Jim McCoy, Dennis Owens. The Rotary Club of Winsboro, Sam Arnett. The Rotary Club of York, William Fisher. Let's take just one moment to remember these Rotarians. Thank you. I want to thank all of those who offered up prayer and a special thank you to past District Governor Sue for our memorial service. Over the past year, I have visited some of your clubs in person and some others through Zoom. And I have asked you to think about a question. What is your Rotary story? Why did you join Rotary? And why have you stayed? Now, these are very important questions if you're planning to recruit someone to your Rotary Club. But more importantly, this morning, I ask you, what will be your life story? What is it that your friends, your family members, and those who have crossed your path, what will they say about you? not what the preacher says at your funeral service, because they are always nice and say good things about you, whether they're true or not. But I'm talking about the real you. What will people say? The legacy of how you used your time, your talents, and your treasure. Their story of those three things will live on long after you're gone. I promise I'm not an undertaker or an employee of a funeral home, but I think that these things are necessary for us to think about. 
We all want to leave a legacy of hope, action, and service. But it will not be accidental. It will have to be very intentional. The Rotary theme this year is Rotary Opens Opportunities. And I have found this to be so true. Opportunities to impact my community. Opportunities to impact the world. Opportunities that have impacted me as a person. But service is the key to all three. In fact, it was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. who said service is the rent we pay for our time here on earth. So how are you using your time? You know that there is something that we all have in common 24 hours in a day. I do not have more time than Faith, and Faith does not have more time than our new governor, Frank. We all have the same number of hours. Do we use them to encourage others? Will you go to school and read to a child? Will you take time to visit a senior citizen? These things do not cost any money. They just take our time. And I have to tell you that last night I reflected on something that Vanessa Irwin said when she was making her presentation yesterday uh, after receiving this beautiful pen. Where's Governor Beth? Thank you so much for recognition of my service. But I happened to think about what Vanessa said about Mother Teresa. When the man found her, she was cleaning latrines. That is truly service above self. How many of us are willing to do the unpleasantness of service? We all have the same amount of time and we can all use it to serve others. But unlike time, we all have different talents. Have you ever given thought to what your talents are and how to best use them? not just for you, but for others. How can we avoid the temptation of it's all about me and understand that we have unique purposes. We have unique talents. These relate to our experiences, our education and our spheres of influence, but they can all be used to make the lives of others better. You may be a wonderful artist who could paint a beautiful piece that would make others smile. You might be able to play passionately on a piano and make people beam from the sound of the music. You may have a green thumb that everything, every plant you touch just blossoms or vegetables just grow from the touch of your hand of work. You may be an excellent writer you may be a beautiful storyteller. You may be able to give the best hugs. And that's what I say about one of my friends named Ruthie. Nobody gives hugs like Ruthie. You may have a natural smile that it just ignites the heart of someone else. You might be a gifted photographer and sharing that talent can help others. So I ask you today, inventory your talents, use them for good and don't let them go to waste. Share them. Just like talents, we have varying amounts of treasure. Yet it is like time. How we use our treasure is what counts. Is it all about us and our fancy cars, our big houses, our expensive vacations? all of which are good things, as long as we are able to share our wealth, our treasures with others, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to give a hand up to the needy. Let us avoid the temptation and pitfalls 
of it all being about our personal gain. For when we think of others and how we can help them, we will find contentment that no amount of money can buy. I have heard it said that when we die, no one will remember what kind of car we drove, the house we lived in, or the kind of clothes we wear, but they will remember what kind of person we are. While we're living here, let's remember a quote that Maya Angelou once said, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. An outstanding NBA coach Pat Riley once said, it's so easy to be selfish, to play the game just for me. But he goes on to say, you must give up something for the team. Comfort, ease, recognition, quick rewards to attract something better in the future. For us, that's eternal. Loving, caring, and serving are attributes of a legacy worth leaving. In closing, I would like to say, look at each day for the rest of your life as an opportunity to write your life story. One of my bucket list items is actually to write a book. But if I never get that done, I hope that my life will have written a bestseller. For today, whatever your faith, we are all called to be servants. As Rotarians, we tout the motto, service above self. Let us live it out. Each day, ask your God to give you eyes to see and ears to hear the needs of others as you interact with them giving of yourself to make their life better. And in turn, that will give you great peace and joy within. Amen. Friends, would you pray with me, please? Lord, as we remember these Rotarians who have come and gone before us, grant us wisdom and help us trust you during times of loss. Please give us patience and endurance to see your unfolding plan. Let us not be turned inward, but let us instead reach out to a hurting world. May we be filled with compassion and drawn to action. Strengthen us as we offer ourselves as servants to your will. Allow us to recognize the ways in which we can help others and give us the confidence to go forth. Please help us remember that all we have comes from you. Give us generous and loving hearts that we may share with others. Lord, above all else, help us show that your love extends to everyone and no one is left out. We ask these things knowing that you, Lord, as always, will make a way in the wilderness and streams in the desert for your people in our communities and our world. Amen. I didn't know this when we were planning the conference, but June is actually Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month. I didn't know that, but I did know that I wanted to have a program on CART and on Alzheimer's today, because how many people in here have been affected by Alzheimer's through a family member, a loved one? I know I have. I lost my, my favorite grandmother, one of my favorite people in the world to it. 
and uh, several other people, but I know uh, what it does, and I know how hard it is on families. And so today we're going to look at two aspects of Alzheimer's. We're going to look at first what we as Rotarians do through our CART program. Uh, it's, it's a program that started, and Bill Shilato is going to tell us more about it, but it started um, a couple decades ago, and as of May 2020, and this has certainly changed as of the uh, grants that were awarded just a few weeks ago, we as, we as Rotarians in uh, the districts mainly in the southeastern part of the United States had contributed at that time almost $10 million to 55 grants for coin, uh, through coins for Alzheimer's research trust. These are going to, um, they're going to create cutting edge research, research that is so cutting edge that it's not funded by some of the traditional sources of funding for Alzheimer's research. And it's the type of research that is going to help, uh, um, help us fight this disease, prevent it, and lessen the impact of it. So without, without Steve Black reminding me today, and thank you again for your service as CART chair for a number of years, you have your blue buckets. If you're a Rotarian, you know what the blue buckets are. They're CART buckets. I have been cashless the whole uh, conference, so I'm making my first donation for for this morning, so I would encourage you before you leave today to make a donation for in the blue bucket for CART, or if you don't have um, it, have your um, money with you, any cash with you, we have a new great online CART portal where you can make online donations. And Steve was telling me that we have not been impacted as much by COVID and the le um, not having meetings, rotary meetings, because so many people have taken to the uh, CART portal to make online donations. And for that, we have to thank, guess who, our own Terry Weaver for helping put that together and making that successful. So our first speaker we're going to hear from today is Bill Shilato. Bill is the executive director of CART, uh, which, as you know, stands for Coins for Alzheimer's Research Trust, or as I like to say, uh, Cash for Alzheimer's Research Trust. Uh, Bill is the owner of NC Wireless LLC. He is from North Carolina, and he also has an MBA from Harvard Business School. He has taught at the Department of Social Services at West Point, and he was a district governor of our neighboring 7620, which is in North Carolina, and he's a member of the Rotary Co Club of Catawba in Conover. And he's going to tell us what our CART dollars go for, what we're paying for, what we're doing every time we make a donation through the blue buckets or through the online portal. So Bill, it's my honor to recognize you today and congratulations on what you do for CART. Yes. Good morning. So good to be with you. Uh, Governor Beth, uh, Governor-elect uh, Frank, thank you for this opportunity to be with us, and Steve, thank you for your wonderful service uh, to CART. Uh, I don't start CART presentations very often without mentioning Roger Ackerman, who hated this when we, we uh, gave him his credit and called him the founder of CART. Uh, he would uh, rebuke that, uh, very humble person, uh, role model for me, a great mentor to me, uh, and I miss him almost every day. I think about Roger and what he means to me personally, but for CART and in, uh, in general, and for the organizations, the Rotary organizations that he's touched. So, so recently, my wife and I had a chance to attend another uh, church to just to visit another church. Uh, there's a new pastor. Uh, there and we'd heard of great things about him. So we went and we slid into a seat. There was a young couple there and we sat down beside them just before the pastor mounted the podium, came up to the big lectern there, made a big show of taking a big watch off and placing it down in front of him. Uh, and so I leaned over to the couple next to me and I said, what does that mean? And they said, nothing. <laughs> But Governor Beth, I promise I'll stay as close to the script as I can and keep us uh, on track. So 
what do we ask our three member panel? You recall that we're all lay people, except for Dr. Gary Goforth, who you know very well. We're lay people and we wouldn't understand a, a letter of intent or what the uh, researchers would like to do with the funds that we're prepared to give them. Uh, so we asked them to sort through and review 30 to 80 letters of intent. And then we ask them to narrow those 10 letters or those 30, 80 letters of intent down to 10 to 15 and then collaborate with each other to uh, recommend the top award. And recall the top award has always been uh, our I promise the last uh, since 2003, we promised to do $250,000 awards. So when they write their grant request, they write it for $250,000. Keep that number in mind. Then we ask them to collaborate and tell us the top award. And then because we've had additional funds, as uh, Governor uh, Beth told you earlier uh, today, that we, uh, we achieved a significant amount of money this year, again, uh, for third year in a row. So we were able to fund additional five uh, research grants. And uh, I'm gonna count those down for you today. We're gonna go through those six that were awarded uh, today. So that's what we ask of them to do. And so as a layperson, I've tried to characterize how this funds look or what, what are the researchers helping us look for in the guidance that we've given them. And the guidance we've given them is we want a prevention or a cure for this. We want to end this disease. The day that we do, Roger said we'll close our doors. We will no longer be needed once we find the prevention or cure for Alzheimer's, which we're struggling to, to do. So uh, I've tried to take those researchers, the 61 now, uh, Governor Beth mentioned 55 plus the ones we awarded in this May were six additional, so we're at 61 grant total. What you've done as a, as a Rotary organization is fund 61 unique and uh, significant grants in this area. So elimination of plaques, uh, early on plaques, amyloid beta plaques, you've all heard about them. You know that they build up in the brain. Uh, for a long time, uh, they were considered the source of the disease. But now there are many researchers who believe that the plaque buildup is a natural body brain uh, reaction to help slow the disease down. So there's, there's discord in the uh, research community uh, that is not all on the amyloid beta plaque. We began to look at tau tangles early on because of our research scientists ground, uh, took us uh, into a different direction you know, away from amyloid beta plaques, took us in a different direction, and uh, we began to look at tau tangles through various research opportunities. We also know that uh, penetration of the blood-brain barrier is gonna be important, and I'll explain a little bit more here after this next uh, entry is, this FDA approval of novel use drugs. So if there is a drug out there that's already been safety approved and we can get it through the blood brain barrier, which I'll go into more detail in a little bit, we can advance a cure or a prevention seven to eight years. That's significant in somebody's life. Uh, how many lives would we save if we could advance it? And so if there's a drug out there that would uh, change the dynamics of this or slow it down, and we can get it through the blood-brain barrier, that would be significant. The other thing that uh, my lay eyes tell me that our researchers got us to is this thing called early detection. Most of, not all the trials that the major uh, pharmaceuticals have done have been uh, in late stage Alzheimer's, way too late. Once the brain's destroyed, it's destroyed. And so significant amount of money has gone to research that has not had any benefit to us. So the blood-brain barrier I was talking about earlier, the, the research that we funded out of the University of uh, uh, Texas in Austin, and we've also uh, funded research out of the Harvard uh, Medical uh, School for blood-brain uh, uh, research. So uh, I learned what a Dalton was. A Dalton is a very small uh, measurement. It's a tiny, tiny measurement. Uh, and so the blood-brain barrier, anything greater than eight Daltons typically will not pass through the blood-brain barrier. And if it's not very lipid, it won't pass through. Uh, this research that we funded uh, showed us that if we have a molecule 
up to 17 or 1800 Daltons that we can attach to this special molecule that lets the brain, uh, blood brain, opens up the blood brain barrier, helps that molecule come through there. Uh, it's like a, a marker that the blood brain barrier recognizes and say, come on in, you're safe. So if we found a drug that can we keep it in the 1718 Daltons, we can get it through the blood brain barrier safely uh, and hopefully treat the disease if that's where the uh, cause or the uh, requirement is. That research came out of a CART grant, uh, two different CART grants, and those together uh, brought us to that, uh, that source. The very first research grant that we did in 1999, and all the funds were raised for that grant. That was a hundred thousand dollar grant, and we worried that you know who would who would submit for that. We had eight applicants for that. Uh, the research committee at that time was different from the group that we have now, but they agonized over whether to give it to Emory University, Dr. Lau and Dr. Uh, Alan Levy, who many of you have heard his name previously, uh, came down between Emory University and a study out of Harvard. I am so thankful and so grateful that that committee chose Emory University and Dr. Alan Levy. Dr. Alan Levy serves on our review committee, continues to be a great resource of information for our executive team and for myself. And so we have him in, uh, in our, uh, uh, in our uh, group of people who are helping us fight this disease and continues to communicate with us. Uh, Dr. Alan Levy is also a medical doctor. He practices with patients. And so he's not only doing research, he has actual patients that he works with uh, and uh, sees those and relays some stories, some, some beautiful stories and some heartbreaking stories to us through his medical practice. We gave him the funds, Cart gave him the funds, $100,000 to research early detection. After that uh, effort, uh, Dr. Levy will tell you openly, honestly, he utterly failed. There is still no blood test, and this was in 1999. There, uh, there's still no blood test. There's no simple test for uh, Alzheimer's or early detection through the blood test. For many years, I told people that the only way you could tell if somebody had Alzheimer's is during autopsy. And that's way too late in my mind, maybe yours too, uh, to tell somebody that they've got Alzheimer's. And I used to think that I wouldn't want to know if there were early detections, but I've completely changed my thinking on that. I now want to know, and so I could volunteer to be in a, a research program, and there are many, many out there. Uh, go to the US government, uh, dot research, and you'll find uh, lots of uh, uh, opportunities. There were seven research uh, uh, trials going on with Alzheimer's in my area in North Carolina. He utterly failed in this early detection uh, through a blood test, but he found a gene. He found a gene that mutates, that's the LR11, that uh, has become very widely known uh, in the medical uh, institutions uh, that is a precursor for uh, Alzheimer's. And so if we can isolate that gene, understands what causes that gene to mutate, it would go a long way in helping us. So great deal of information. There are no failures in research, in my mind. There are no failures. As long as we do our diligence and we give it to uh, organizations who are working on this in a very uh, methodical way, we gain with every penny that we spend on research. Out of our research, uh, we found this PIB. <clears throat> uh, with this dye, we can put in the, in the, in the intravenously. It'll combine with the amyloid beta plaques and we can measure the amount of amyloid beta plaques, which is a really good marker for uh, uh, Alzheimer's. It's not a complete marker, but uh, Dr. Carl, uh, uh, Dr. Harry Levine uh, helped us with that uh, research uh, and it uh, marks those uh, genes for us and he was able to do it live. So now we've got uh, a test albeit a very expensive test. So I asked one of our researchers the other day, what does it cost to do a PIB uh, uh, on a person if they want a diagnosis through that method? He said anywhere from fifteen dollars to $17,000 it costs to do it. So it's way too much. Uh, we still need a blood test. Uh, we're fortunate now that we can detect amyloid beta plaques with a spinal tap. So we don't have to wait to autopsy to diagnose uh, someone with Alzheimer's. We can do it through a spinal tap now. Uh, this, uh, this researcher, we funded her, Maya Corona Amadi. She came from Israel, uh, recruited to Cedar sinai in California, specifically for her knowledge and her capability on neuroscience and particularly Alzheimer's disease. 
We gave her funds to uh, research the amyloid beta plaques uh, di dispersal. Uh, while in her research, she discovered that you could see the amyloid beta plaques build up in the, uh, in the eye. And with a uh, scan of the eye, you could see the amount of amyloid beta plaques meeting a certain level, uh, and you could diagnose Alzheimer's that way. So not fully accepted in the medical world yet, but it's a unique uh, finding that came out of our, one of our researchers. One of the things that we think that CART brings, or we know CART brings, is the ability for young researchers to bring their ideas forward, get some funds, uh, get the recognition. I, I tell uh, my executive, I remind them every day that we give these researchers funds, we grant them those funds that are awarded to them to do the research, but the recognition that comes with having three renowned scientists choose you out of 30 to 80 letters of intent with all the things that are competing out there, and we identify your research and you as an individual uh, that's worthy of this, the recognition just propels them and puts wind in their sail, keeps them involved, and invites other researchers who are coming out of these medical schools who are making decisions for what they're gonna do with the rest of their life. They look at this and see it as a huge challenge. I feel a buzz, I don't know about you, but uh, eight to 10 years ago, it was down, uh, the, the mood in the industry was down. I mean, this research, there was no hope, there was no uh, real fire. Over the last three to four years, and in particular the last couple of years, when we talk to these researchers, there's a real buzz. There's a, there's a feeling in the industry, we're gonna find a, a, a solution to this problem sooner rather than later. But what it, what it also brings, uh, these grants are potential uh, funding beyond that. So if they have a, a novel idea and there's not much research behind it, the NIH, NIH and these uh, major pharmaceuticals won't fund it. But talk to, take Dr. Alan Levy, who got our first $100,000 grant. <clears throat> Uh, he parlayed that into a 7.2 million NIH grant, and then shortly after that, he got a private foundation grant of $25 million. Emory Institution continues to just generate uh, great research funds, and uh, their work is uh, renowned around the world. They are members of international groups who study this thing. Uh, Dr. Carl Lander, with a $250,000 grant at the time, uh, uh, parlayed that into a $1 million NIH grant and then followed up with a $200 million grant from the GlaxoSmith client. Uh, and Dr. Harry Levine received a $250,000 grant in 2009, parlayed it into a $22 million NIH grant. That's what CART does. It's, we consider ourselves the venture capital and we prove research that would not otherwise have gotten funded. Dr. Frank Sharp uh, out of the uh, UC Davis told me he tried five years to get funds for his unique research about bacteria and, and finally CART funded his research. So I want to give you a quick update on CART today. Uh, we are now in 23 Rotary districts, and I'm working to grow those districts, mainly in zones 33 and 34, which most of us know well. Uh, we'll be in Naples, Florida, and then September, uh, late September, uh, with our Zone Institute. It's my best recruiting opportunity. I'll be there, and we'll be looking for additional uh, uh, districts that have not joined us out of 33 and 34. And I'm able to reach districts that I couldn't before because of uh, a growing expertise in this Zoom thing. So 23 rotor districts or cart giving districts, 61 grants, $10.2 million. And the, the cart fund re recalled that 100% of everything that goes in the little blue bucket, everything that goes through the portal uh, must, uh, must go to research. Our recipients this year, Dr. Kasich, uh, so she's a PhD from Salk Institute. She received not a $250,000 award because our research scientists, our review panels came back to us and said, this is some of the best research that we've run across in a long time. Let's award the top award at $300,000 and we'll add uh, one or two aims to this uh, research and we'll get a much better uh, uh, function out of this. The board, since Roger passed away, has elected to name that top research grant uh, the Roger and Dini Ackerman Award, Memorial Award. So uh, Dr. Susan Cage from the Salk Institute got that award this year. Her research, if you go back to my thinking on how I categorize these, uh, these uh, she's looking for a cause. She's looking for the cause of uh, uh, Alzheimer's. Uh, and it's 
it almost blows your mind to think that of the top 10 killers in uh, uh, diseases in North America and the world, in North America in particular, Alzheimer's is the only one we don't know what causes it. All the other killers, we know what causes it, and we have ways of slowing it down and preventing it and treating it uh, uh, effectively. But Alzheimer's, we have no effective treatment, uh, even with this latest announcement from, from Biogen, which I can cover in more detail if you want me to. So uh, Dr. Kasich, her research is all about uh, the microglia and the TRM cells. So microglia, think of them as our, uh, as our maids and janitors. The microglia clears out a bunch of junk in our head and our brain, uh, and they do a great job of that. But when they sense an infection, they turn into soldiers. And so they uh, trade in their brooms and pick up swords, and they start fighting. And when they start fighting it, uh, the, uh, the infection, uh, it also, if they're overactive, can create damage. And that's one of the research. She wants to know why the microglia, our maids and our janitors, turn into soldiers uh, and become toxic to the brain. So that's her research, and we're and we, uh, off to a good start with, uh, with Susan. Dr. Jose Alessandre uh, out of Florida, uh, Jackson was to keep count with me. That's three hundred thousand dollars. This is two hundred thousand dollars. The test is for a uh, hypothesis that tau impairs the ribosomes and the ribosomes are nothing more than uh, helping building blocks of protein assort themselves correctly so that our brain can function with them and use them appropriately. That's all the ribosomes do. They're building they're building blocks for us. So he wants to determine why they, uh, it, why tau impairs that function and then doesn't allow them to do the job that they're supposed to. He has a unique way of measuring it, and that's why our three group research scientists elected to uh, fund him. Dr. Uh, Nicholas Bartholomew uh, out of the Washington University uh, Medicine in St. Louis. And that name keeps coming up, that Washington University. There's some great research coming out of that organization. This is the fourth or fifth grant that we've gone to that organization, not to the same doctor, but a different researcher out of that. They're attracting some great young researchers and they're, they're making waves in the, in the industry. I believe the University of Washington out of St. Louis is one of the reasons there's great buzz because there's some great research coming out of that. So uh, here's one of those tests where we want early detection. It's a blood test for early stage Alzheimer's disease and asymptomatic population. So what uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Bartholomew has done is he's tied in not only looking for amyloid beta plaques in the blood, but he's tied it also looking for a P tau 217. And the elevations of the, of the amyloid beta plaque in the blood uh, uh, system levels out to a point where it's hard to detect any, any changes in it. But he says that he has a way of measuring this PTAL-217 in combination with the amyloid beta plaques in the blood that he can declare uh, that is a significant blood test. And we wish him luck in that, that effort. Uh, here's a $100,000 award to Dr. Maya Wong uh, out of the... Uh, uh, State University of New York in Syracuse, first research grant that we've given there, and we did $100,000 there. Uh, so her research is investigate alternative gene splicing that may contribute to out, uh, Alzheimer's to pathology and connect uh, cognitive effects. Uh, it, it's, uh, her research uh, leads some areas that we wanted to go further into. That's why she didn't get the full $250,000 that she applied for. Now, I will tell you that the researchers who apply for $250,000 grant and we come back and say, I'm sorry, the, the funds are not there to give you the full award. Would you rewrite your statement of work and accept $100,000? never had anybody turn us down. They've all accepted it. So, uh, it, but we get great research out of that. And, and to tell you, I think we get really bargain research out of that. Dr. Gilbert uh, Gallardo is a $100,000 recipient as well. Research uh, identifying anti-inflammatory molecules of therapeutic in interventions in Alzheimer's. So uh, his research is uh, about uh, why the astrocytes turn toxic. 
Why do our astrocytes, and astrocytes are nothing more than little uh, worker bees that run around in our brains and take proteins to different sites to make sure that there's uh, properly distributed in the head. But when the astrocytes turned uh, neurotoxic, he has a way of unique way of attempting to measure that uh, that change from the, in our astrocytes. Uh, to become toxic, and we want to know more about his research in that regard. Uh, Dr. Si Hung, uh, Hung Chow, you will find this interesting, another uh, Harvard grant. Harvard applied for about 15 years before they ever got a research grant. And so that you think about the amazing uh, uh, talent that you have at an institution like Harvard, and, and they did not come to the top of the cream of the crop until about 15 years in this $100,000 award. You'll enjoy this one. Uh, We've done study on sleep, and now we're doing a study on the impact of exercise. So we know when you exercise, your, uh, this uh, hormone uh, risen uh, elevates in your bloodstream. So we know that, uh, and we can measure that. Uh, and so he's studying this effect of arisen, the elevation of the arisen, to reduce the uh, 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 tau tangles and reduce the uh, amyloid beta plaques buildup. So we wish him well in that. So all we have to do is sleep well and exercise well, and you'll be fine. <laughs> I've talked to the researchers enough to know that what we do as Rotarians is a great barrier to preventing Alzheimer's. And what they say is be social, be active, uh, stay involved with each other, help others, uh, and you'll, uh, uh, you'll avoid Alzheimer's uh, uh, to the best degree you can. And so I tell people, if you want to avoid Alzheimer's, uh, join Rotary. And so look for a membership, join it that way. So this is the CARC Fund, uh, mycarcfund.org. Uh, uh, this is the uh, uh, site that you can go to with the donor portal. And I'm going to talk about the donor portal here in just a second. Uh, our, our website, though, is the carcfund.org. It's uh, under rebuild right now. The old uh, website's still up, but we're working on the new one. I couldn't leave here today without talking about some superstars in this district that have advanced the cause of CART so much. You just heard the uh, memorial service for uh, past District Governor Bruce Baker, served as a CART president for multiple years, took us through uh, 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 early stages when we went from one Rotary district giving to 11 districts and then took us to uh, into an era where we were 14 or 15 and now we're 23. My good friend, uh, Jim Pereer served as that uh, review, uh, that grant committee vice president for many, many years. And Jim, thank you for the bar that you set, that Gary Gofor took that baton from you and has carried it on greatly. So you see Jim here, Jim's with us this morning. Thank you, Jim, for being here. Gary Goreforth, who I, needs no introduction, we all know him, a wonderful, wonderful doctor, does so much for Rotary, but finds time to be the research grant uh, uh, vice president for CART. Steve Black, I don't know what to say about it. Just, you're just the best. CART cups are the hottest item on the market. And just they, people want CART cups. Uh, they love the blue buckets, but the CART cups are a huge hit. They came out of Steve Black, came out of your effort. This district continues to be one of the top givers out of the 23 districts. And Steve Black, you've been a big part of that in support with all your governors, George Fletcher. Uh, Miles Golden, uh, I can just go right down the list, uh, and, and including Beth and Carol Burdett. And uh, speaking of Carol, she's the only person I know that has volunteered to shave their head uh, to raise funds. And did she raise some funds last year? Uh, Single-handedly uh, uh, raised $136,000, $146,000. Brings me to Terry Weaver, past district governor Terry Weaver, wrote the RFP that, that allowed us to get this uh, donor portal. I was so concerned going into this year without us being able to meet, what would happen to the blue buckets? What would happen to our donations? Started, uh, 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 Terry started us about three and a half, four years ago on this effort to get a donor portal. Wrote the RFP, evaluated the uh, 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 responses to those, and uh, took uh, uh, took those uh, and and then turned them into the highest, uh, the largest uh, request for funds for the uh, grant was one hundred sixty thousand dollars. DAC DB folks came in at about twenty two thousand dollars. We had a bid at ten thousand dollars. We worked with the ten thousand dollar bid for about four or five months until we rejected them. They just weren't going to be able to answer the message. 
Terry picked it up, turned it over to the DAC-DED, and we now have a donor portal. This year, for the third year in a row, we've been able to grant $1 million. So $10.2 million. Terry, thank you very much for allowing us to do it. Be glad to take for a few minutes for your questions, please. Bill, thank you so much. Bless thank you. you. Bless you for what um, you do. Thank you for, for this. And Bill, in, um, in honor of you coming today, in honor of you coming today, we are on behalf of District 7750 making a donation to CART in your name. So, so thank you very much. Thank you for the informative speech. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate yeah. you guys. We, our next speaker is Sam Wiley with the South, uh, South Carolina chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. Uh, he lives in Anderson and he is the vice president of programs for the Alzheimer's Association. And it's a role he served in for nine years. He has 20 years experience working for the aging and in the disability field. He has a bachelor's in psychology from Clemson University and a background in case management and informational referrals. And throughout his career, he has worked extensively with individuals and families uh, involving Alzheimer's disease. And so today, <coughs> Sam's gonna talk about the impact of Alzheimer's on the caregivers, on the families. Uh, when we make donations through CART, we're working to end the disease and we think about the people suffering from it. But there is a huge financial, emotional and physical toll on the caregivers. So Sam is gonna share that, ver that part of the story of Alzheimer's with us. So Sam. Good morning. It's good to be with you. I just want to say thank you to each and every one of you for your time and commitment and, and efforts and contributions to make this world a little bit better place. So thank you to each of you out there. So we've heard Mr. Bill did a great job of, there is a lot of great research that is going on uh, at this moment uh, in the field of Alzheimer's and related dementia and a lot of the good uh, research is taking place um, that we just now witnessed. So that is great to see. There's a lot of smart people that are working to find a cure to make it better for families and individuals. And so I, I rest hope on that as well. And we're seeing that. We'll spend a few minutes looking at the impact of Alzheimer's disease on family caregivers, uh, that are providing that care for those loved ones, not only with Alzheimer's, but uh, other related dementias. So let's look at this for a few moments. Approximately two thirds of dementia caregivers are women at this time. We see that women are our healthcare decision makers in the family. And my wife is very good about reminding me, hey, I gotta get to the doctor, I've gotta do this, I'm taking care of these things. That's what we see. We also see that 30% of family caregivers with dementia are age 65 and older. Now let me stop for a second to say that when I say dementia, I'm talking general, a general term, okay? Alzheimer's is the destruction of the brain cells. And as those brain cells are destroyed, causes dementia, okay? So when someone says, hey Sam, uh, my loved one has dementia, I may have dementia. The next question is, is what type of dementia? Is it Alzheimer's? Is it frontotemporal dementia? Is it Lewy bodies with dementia? Okay, is it mixed dementia? So I just wanted to kind of jump on, make sure we're on the same terms there. Over half of the caregivers are providing assistance to a parent or uh, in-law with dementia. Over 60% of the caregivers are married, living with a partner or a spouse. Approximately 40% of dementia caregivers have a college degree or more advanced education. So what does it look like in hours and cost at this point in time? So in 2020, and this is coming from the annual Alzheimer's disease facts and figures, we're seeing that over 11 million Americans are providing unpaid care for people with Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And from that care, it's about 15.3 billion hours of unpaid care that's been provided, billion, at a value cost of $257 billion. The families are providing, paying for that care. 
In South Carolina, we see that it's 199,000 uh, individuals, family caregivers for dementia, and that care that they're providing is 2.9 million hours, which is total at 4.4 billion in South Carolina, and that's, two, that's last year. So this is a costly disease. We don't have a cure for this disease at this moment, but the healthcare continues to rise. The cost continues to rise. It's very difficult to treat, very difficult to um, provide the care that um, those individuals are needing is costly. And so until we can find that cure, until we can get some better research and information and technology in place, we're gonna continue to see uh, this, the cost shoot up. So what about health and well-being for the dementia caregiver? Okay, 59% of dementia family caregivers rated emotional stress of caregiving as high or very high. You see that spousal caregivers that are caring for partners with, the, with dementia uh, are seeing that there's a 30% increase of depression versus non-dementia family caregivers. In a poll, women's poll in 2014, um, half of the women in the poll that were caring for not only their children, but also for uh, a parent or a loved one with dementia said that it was more difficult to provide care for that adult with dementia than raising that child. You see on the slide, 74% of dementia caregivers report somewhat concerned, the very concerned about maintaining their own health. And we see that now. I actually had a conversation with one of my staff. Recently, she's caring for her dad uh, with some memory, cognitive impairment. He's got some dementia. I don't think it's caused by Alzheimer's at this point. However, she said, my health is failing. I have not had time to take care of myself because I'm so busy with day to day to day to operations, medical bills coming in. This is prescribed. This wasn't prescribed rearranging, filling out applications. It's gotten tough and that's adding stress and, and the whole, her own health is being affected. Uh, we do see the stress associated with dementia, uh, increasing the caregiver's ability, uh, susceptibility to disease and health complications. The more stress we are, we're starting to see where that's taking a toll and that's opening us up for more things from a health standpoint. So we look in South Carolina Right now we're seeing that 54% of caregivers report experiencing chronic health problems. 21.9% of uh, caregivers report having experience with depression, either having depression right now or currently under it, or have had it. 11% of South Carolina caregivers report being in poor physical health, which that number's sort of lower, which is good to see. It's not what we want it to be. We'd like to have a zero there, but uh, we do are experiencing that. So those are a few, few of many uh, numbers of what family caregivers are going through, providing care for family members, uh, loved ones. It's difficult because you're not only having to do physical tasks for that loved one as they continue to progress through the disease, but you're having to kind of, you're having to think for that individual. You're having to kind of, you have to keep that individual of who is that person who are they in the height of their life? What are their personalities? What are their likes? What are their dislikes? Because you're going to need to rely on that information of who that person is as you're providing care. And that's very challenging, difficult. As I saw earlier, there's a lot of you that have been affected by Alzheimer's or related dementia. And you know what I'm speaking of. So when you see here is uh, 10 ways to manage caregiver stress. I want to throw in here a couple of numbers uh, of what maybe some common stress of being a caregiver looks like. Before we can get to this point, we need to know, are we under stress? So we see denial about the disease and its effects on the person who's been diagnosed. I know mom's going to get better. Anger, we see anger at the person living with the disease. They're not able to do the task they used to do anymore. And we start to get, become a little upset at that person maybe holler or scream at them, not meaning to, but we're like, they used to, they can always do that. Can always button his shirt. He's just being stubborn. We see social withdrawal from friends and family and activities, caregiver stress, anxiety about the future, depression that affects your ability to cope, 
exhaustion that interferes with important daily tasks. You're just exhausted. You're flat out exhausted. You're providing care a lot of times 24 hours. Family caregivers providing care in the home a lot of times are providing care that actually individuals that may be living in a facility receive eight to nine different workers that might provide that care for someone uh, in a facility, medicine, bath, food, clothes. Yet the family caregiver is doing that themselves at home. It, sleeplessness, sleeplessness caused by worrying, lack of sleep, irritability that leads to the moodiness and triggers negative responses, lack of concentration that disrupts familiar tasks, health problems that begin to take its toll mentally and physically. So we look at that when we're stressed, we recognize that, and then we move to this. And some of you look at it and say, yeah, I know. We know that we're supposed to do some of these things. Take a break. It's easier said than done, and I, get, I understand that. I get that. But we do see that if you're able to take a break and rest the care, um, just to get a day or minutes that you're able to kind of recharge, so critical and so important. Um, the association, other agencies out there are able to work with families to kind of help identify and, and move forward to see what services are available. Seek out community resources. What's the plan? What's the short-term plan? What's the long-term plan? And we need resources for both of those, what we need to be aware of, what's available, okay? And that's what we start. We sit down with families and say, all right, what's our plan? What do you as a family caregiver want to see happen? And that's where we start and we build from that. Doesn't mean we always get to that point, but we really try to make sure that we can identify all the resources so that we can help that family member, that family be able to get to the outcome that they'd like to see. Become an educated caregiver. Um, there's gonna be new skill sets in caregiving that's gonna have to be developed and learned as that person with the disease continues to progress. Okay, early stage, middle stage, late stage. And each stage brings on newer um, difficulties. Get the help and find support. Again, this is things that we know, right? We know that we need to do this, but it's easier said than done, especially when you're caregiving and you're into it day in, day out. It's hard to break out of that. Take care of your own health. Manage your level of stress. So stress can cause physical problems like blurred vision, uh, stomach upset, high blood pressure, uh, changes in behavior, irritability, lack of concentration. I know when I sleep, when I'm lack of sleep, I'm very irritable, very irritable. And we are seeing that sleep and the disruption of sleep is there could be some correlation with perhaps Alzheimer's disease. And we heard that a little bit earlier from Mr. Bill. Manage your stress, set these changes as they occur. Change, control what you can control, all right? Make those legal and financial plans, especially as soon as you're able to, when you recognize it's, it's difficult. Uh, I have a, uh, a, a close friend that contacted me about a week ago and said, hey, look, I, I need to talk to you, this is confidential. My, uh, my mom uh, has just been diagnosed with early Alzheimer's. He said, what do we do? Where do we go? Where do we start? And so I told him, I said, let's, I said, first and foremost, she's in earlier stages. When you and your family are going to have to come together, you're going to have to have a heart to heart. Got to do it. At some point in time, if you're a family caregiver, caring for someone, there's going to have to be a heart to heart moment at some point in time. With my friends and my mother, you're going to be able to have that a little earlier. So she, as in early stages, can still make some decisions on her care have a say in her decisions of what she would like uh, is so important. And then get those legal and financial plans in place to living wills, healthcare power of attorneys. Because I know from experience that the sooner the better. It's just like everything else. If we can get out front of some things early enough, like we can with all of the diseases, the better quality of life and care a person is going to be able to receive and have. I've seen it firsthand. I have. Many times, early stage individuals that have been in the early stage and getting their care, changing the lifestyle, have had a quality of life I didn't think could be possible, okay? 
know that you're doing your best. We had this conversation a lot with family members. You're doing a good job. You are. And you have to be reassured of that a lot of times because it's difficult. It's easy to find yourself getting into the rut and think, oh, am I doing a good job? Can I do better? And visit a doctor regularly if possible. Again, things that you guys know, things that we all know. Uh, but easier said than done, but sometimes we have to be reminded. So as we were talking about research and money and funding, uh, there is, for some of you that may be aware, for some of you have not <clears throat> seen so far, there has been a new drug that's been approved by the FDA, okay? Uh, this is uh, from Aducatumab. I think it's now uh, uh, Aduhelm. Is that what it's being called? <clears throat> There is, just to let you know at, right out of the gate, there is some um, discussion in the research world. You got some researchers that feel very good that this drug has been approved by the FDA. You got other researchers that not feeling so good about it. Okay, I'm not a researcher. Uh, I do know that what this drug is designed to do is to remove that beta amyloid that Mr. Bill spoke about earlier. We do see that it is a hallmark. And you see that beta amyloid build up in between the cells. So, and what you have is you have the cells, and then you have that dendrite forest where the branches and so memories and thoughts and feelings go from this cell to this cell. And we start to see that beta amyloid in between those. And what this drug is designed to do in earlier stages, mild cognitive impairment, not middle to late. But earlier stages, if it start, this drug goes in and removes that amyloid plaque, okay? The FDA has determined that there is substantial evidence that the added helm reduces amyloid plaques in the brain, that the reduction in these plaques is reasonably likely to predict uh, really important benefits to the patients. Um, it's designed to improve that earlier stage. That's why it's so important for early detection because if you're not, if you're not been diagnosed, you're not going to be able to be eligible for this drug. Um, but it goes in, and, and the idea is, is that the association has been supportive of this FDA approval. Uh, what this drug is going to do for those that um, are eligible for it is that it could mean that a family member has a one more good day or a few more days, a few more days of their memory that they can share with their family, that they can engage, that they can interact, okay? It gives families an option, an option. It doesn't mean that it's gonna be suitable for everyone. It may not work for everybody, okay? Uh, but what it will, we do expect to see as um, we expect to see that this uh, drug be put into play. It's going to be expensive for some. It's going to be through infusion. Uh, but there has been evidence, enough evidence for the FDA to prove that, hey, this drug could be eligible. And it would be uh, something that may be able to help improve a person's life. And so there's more coming out of it. It's, uh, there's a lot of going on back and forth right now and discussion. So there's more information uh, uh, going on about this. Uh, you can visit to learn more about this uh, drug. I have it on the website here. If you can go to, you want to go to the ALZ.org, it'll be somewhere on that front page. You can learn to read more about what's going on and how it's being moved. And you'll hear more uh, in the news coming up about this drug coming forward. But we do look at this as a positive moving step forward, but there's a lot of other things and barriers that are gonna be in play when this drug comes in that has to be worked out. <clears throat> so there's resources out there. One of the best things I can give anyone and that you can give anyone is the 800 number. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Someone in the middle of the night, there's, there's calls we get all hours of the night, okay? Where someone is being, a family member is upset they're aggressive and the caregiver doesn't know what to do. And they call us and say, I, I don't know what to do. We've had individual, I've had a lady call me one time and said, my husband has Alzheimer's. He's very threatening. He has a knife in his hand. I'm in the back closet, lock the door. What do I do? So we have these kind of calls that are very extreme, but we also have the calls where it's support. 
and just vetting it out with that family caregiver, bouncing ideas all like off of each other, bringing those behavioral problems and concerns and not knowing where to turn. You can come to the association. We can talk about that with you as a family. As well as resources, okay? Where's the area agency on aging? What do they have to provide? What is community long-term care? What does the aid and attendance to the VA look like? What does the respite care look like short-term? There is a respite programs in South Carolina that can pay for uh, someone to come in uh, to, or to have a break so that caregiver can get out, maybe go to the doctor. Maybe they, I know some caregivers have had used the grant that they can come in, uh, bring somebody in to provide care and they go in another room and go to sleep. So that breaking care, so there's resources out there. Support groups, educational programs, uh, early stage engagements, you're starting to see more of that. We have some here in Greenville, believe it or not, early stage engagements. Individuals with the disease are coming together and having fun. And I've had someone, it was in Myrtle Beach one time and she said, Sam, she had Alzheimer's, she's in early stage. She said, you know what? I like to forget that I have Alzheimer's sometimes and just have fun, absolutely. And why shouldn't you? So we have any kind of programs that we do online now. We've learned through COVID that we can do a lot of virtual programming, but we also are getting back out into communities, as you will see, and we can do community education. Uh, we're recruiting volunteers, uh, not only statewide, but nationwide to help us get into the communities, get this disease process and inf information in there, as well as many other things. We do provide safety services, as I mentioned. So if we have maybe a couple minutes for questions, perhaps. That was the quick and skinny, but I know on a Sunday morning, you um, appreciate everyone allowing me to be here with you. If there are any questions. It is, it is all over the United States. Yes, ma'am. That is works. That is our contact center. We have social workers and licensed counselors waiting by the phone. Uh, and then what works is when someone calls that number, they speak with them and then they refer that family member or that individual to the chapters and chapters do their own follow ups about local services and more support and care. Yes, ma'am. Good question. Thank you. Very about the AAA, their area agencies on aging. Would you tell us about the respite care program that uh, has on your Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So there is a respite program. And one of the things I mentioned, um, when we talk to families, the first things we talk about short term plans, what's the short term plans and goals. And there are respite programs. The Alzheimer's Association um, has a respite program that provides anywhere between 500 to perhaps $1,500 to a family caregiver for that respite care. It can be used in the home for care in the home. It could be used for adult daycare services. It could be used to uh, go out of town. I know there's family members that had to go, needed to go to a wedding or a funeral. And so what they ended up doing was, is they were able to apply for this respite care and have someone either come into the home or have that loved one stay in a facility for just a few couple of days while they got out. So it is a program you can contact the Alzheimer's Association at the 800 number if you're interested in learning more about that respite program. The Area Agency on Aging, which is Appalachia Council of Governments here in the upstate in Greenville, we got Catawba in the Rock Hill uh, area. Uh, and as it goes throughout Central Midlands, there's 10 of them from the state unit on aging. Uh, out of Columbia. And so they also have a family caregiver support program and uh, some other state respite funds that was put into play by Lieutenant Governor McConnell back uh, a few years ago. And so what that is, is again, they actually, they, the Area Agency on Aging is administering the Alzheimer's Association respite funds, as well as the family caregiver support program funds. So what families can do is they can contact the association or the Area Agency on Aging, and then what they'll do is they'll sit down with the family and say, okay, if you have an Alzheimer's family member, we'll start with some Alzheimer's funds and first that and get them started on the way. Uh, so that is the, it is a, is a, it is hard to get started with respite, okay? Bringing a, possibly a stranger into the home is difficult. The association has some tips that you could do to perhaps start that journey on getting someone into the home. Because I know family members, once they started that respite care, they, they can't do without it because they've seen the benefits of it. But they had to get through that first part. Any other questions? Okay. 
Sam, thank you very much. Thank you for a very important talk. And in your honor, thank you to the Alzheimer's Association for your uh, coming to us and sharing this with us. So thank you very much. Appreciate okay. it. Yeah. Thank you. So we're going to hear from immediate past district governor, Rob Hanley, with our short business session, followed immediately by soon to be district governor, Frank Cox, and then I will be back for just a couple minutes to close it out. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I would like to convene a business meeting for Rotary District 7750. There are two orders of business on the meeting. One is approval of the 2019-2020 financial statement, and the other is the approval of the 2021-2022 Rotary budget. And am I supposed to drive? The, ah, very good. I asked Elizabeth to put opera glasses in your bag so you could read what's on the slides. She refused, so on your table, you have some sheets of paper. Those sheets of paper provide the information that you're reading there. There are two sets of papers. If you see the one with the rotary emblem, you can put that down for now. The other one is two sheets, a financial statement, and also a certification that the uh, financial information for the 2019-2020 rotary year has been reviewed by an independent committee, and um, the uh, statement is in front of you. I would like to point out a couple of things. This will be, we will ask you to approve this. This is coming from the finance committee. As a motion coming from a committee, it does not need a second. But I would like to point out a couple of things. You will notice on the balance sheet that year over year, there was a $52,000 increase between 2020, uh, from 2018, 2019 to 2019, 2020. That's a little bit of a uh, uh, one-off because of COVID. Because of COVID, we did not have expenses toward the end of the 2019-2020 year that we normally would have. And so if you go to page two of the cash receipts and disbursements, the second page of this, again, you'll notice the same thing, that we did have a net increase, a substantial net increase in, in our financial statement year over year. And more about that in a little bit. The other thing, though, I would like to point out on page two of the disbursements and receipts, this is an important one. It's in the income expense. You will notice under district grants from the Rotary Foundation that there was a $25,000 increase, more or less, between 2018-2019 and 2019-2020. And the reason I want to point that out is that is $25,000 more that this district has to allow its clubs to do work locally. That's why we ask folks to give to the Rotary Foundation, is so that money comes back to the district and we can do work locally. That's an important, important fact that I would like you to take away. That said, are there any questions about the 2019-2020 financial statement? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? So that statement is accepted for business. Then the next thing, next order of business is the budget for the 2021-2022 rotary year. That's the one that has three colors on it. Starts with rotary on the top, rotary 7750. Um, on the second page, on the back page, I would like to point out one thing. You will notice on the bottom line, net income, that we are projecting a substantial loss. There is a reason for that. Year before, we had a substantial increase in income. We are a nonprofit organization. Therefore, the Finance Committee has decided that we will, the district will absorb some expenses in the 2021 2022 rotary year and draw down cash reserves so that we are using your money more wisely. That way, we don't have to ask you for more money. We can control expenses for our district events. So that's an important thing to consider. There is the reason there's a loss shown on this is we are going to draw down cash reserves. Are there any questions about the 2021-2022 budget? 
Then again, that motion has to accept this budget has come from the Finance Committee. Coming from a committee, it does not need a second. Hearing no further discussion, all in favor of approving the 2021-2022 District 7750 budget, say aye. aye. Any opposed? Thank you very much. This business meeting is closed. Okay, I don't know how many of you are competitive barbecue cookers, but I think next year for the very first time in Rock Hill, when we have our conference in May, I went to two clubs and we, I talked about this. On Friday night, we're gonna have a District 7757, I quit. We're gonna have our very first cook-off. On Friday night. It's going to be fun. And we heard through our club, as one of our fundraisers, that the South Carolina Barbecue Professional Association will have a sponsor and get prizes and get points. So I think it might be a fun evening. But we're going to rally together next May at Winthrop University in Rock Hill, and we're going to have another fun outing at there. We've got a hotel that's adjacent to the university that's brand new. It's only been open about two months. They've got this fabulous garden, the Glen Cairn Garden. We're gonna do a tour over there. My wife is a green thumb. I think somebody talked about green thumbs, Carol. And so one of the successes we had at Carol's conference at Clemson was we took a tour of the football facility, which was pretty impressive to be honest. Well, we're hoping to be able to go through the Carolina Panthers brand new spiking. And if you see a rendering of it, it's Star Wars. So I'm hoping that we'll be able to do that and some other things. But I've got a lot of enthusiasm for the people over in the Rock Hill, Fort Mill, Lake Wiley area for us to, keep, to gather there. So I look forward to having everyone there. So another thing we're going to do this year is we're going to have a peace conference. You heard the discussion yesterday, this wonderful DEI panel, well, they at the, the Rotary Club of Greenville have put on two spectacular peace conferences here. And we're gonna do a peace conference next year that's gonna be a joint district and Greenville, Rotary Club of Greenville peace conference, gonna be here in Greenville at the convention center. And we're gonna keep walking up this theme of DEI and have a conference that, that deals with unconscionable, unconscious bias. And some of the speakers that spoke up here today will be part of the program and on the planning committee. So we're going to have two big events next year, and we really look forward to everyone coming. So thank you, and see you next year. Thank you, Frank. And one other big event he didn't mention is November 5th, Friday, November 5th in Spartanburg. We will have in person our Rotary Foundation celebration. We did not have it. It was virtual this past year. So first up is November 5th Foundation. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for staying at the conference. It's been a wonderful, wonderful event, and I appreciate the attendance of all of you. Uh, we are going to adjourn in a a twist on a very traditional way that not just our district, but many districts in the zone adjourn, which is with the song, Let There Be Peace on Earth. The twist is because of COVID, we're still asked not to sing, which is a good thing because you don't want to hear me sing. And so we will have a virtual uh, presentation of Let There Be Peace on Earth, and we're going to adjourn with that. As you're on your way out, we have some extra conference bags, the nice bags that you got for attending. So if you want an extra one, pick it up. If you forgot yours, get it. And so let's stand. And as soon as the, the con uh, as soon as the presentation's over, and I will say thank you again to Terry Weaver for putting a little special touch on this one that's special to me with it being the year of Rotary Opens Opportunities. So um, when this is over, we will just leave, say goodbye to your friends, and we'll clear the house. Thank you all for being here this weekend. Bye-bye.